Praise the Lord. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Master God, we thank you, we praise you for your love, kindness, and grace. We thank you, God, for your mercy, for the opportunity you give us to, to love you, to serve you, to hear, ponder, and grow by your word. So God, we pray that you would speak to each of us, cause us to hear your voice, and surrender to you our, divine, our will, to your divine power and authority. So God, we give you the praise, we give you honor, we give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. It's good to be here again tonight. Um, tonight we're going to take a look at Paul coaching our thinking. Uh, and, and in his coaching our thinking, how we, we um, what we do with our minds, he um, encourages us or he instructs us in how we ought to live and, and be led by the Lord Jesus. So let's go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Beginning at verse 1. It says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any uh, uh, affection and mercy, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind that each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not, not only on his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself with no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Praise God. All right. Let's go back and we're going to walk through this a little bit and see what we can find in here to, to encourage our life and our living. Back to uh, Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. It says, therefore, let me see just 1 and 2 right now. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one, being of one accord and of one mind. Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, and he, he's obviously not with them, but he's talking about uh, how they did what he said when he was present, but now much more they, they do what they need to, to follow his direction as he follows Christ. So he, he, he's not with them, but he is encouraging them and how they ought to live and what they should think. In, in, in chapter 1, he talks about not only serving God, being blessed by God, 
he talks about a willingness to suffer for God. He's saying that, that we should be willing to suffer. Now, uh, suffer is simply giving your will over for God. It is, it is allowing God to, to reign over your life in that you uh, submit to his authority, to his purpose, you give in to who Christ is. So Paul is saying to us, we must be willing to, to suffer, to, to go through some stuff for the cause of Christ, to glorify him, to, to magnify him, to big up God. We ought to be willing to let some of our desires, excuse me, to let our desires go and, and grab hold to what God desires for us. Totally different, totally counterculture to the world we live in. The world we live in tells us to go for it. Get what's going to bless you. Do what's going to make you happy. Handle your stuff. You know, you only go around once. Do, get all that you can get. It don't matter what you do as long as you get what you want and you're happy. Being happy is the whole purpose of life. It it gives us the total opposite, the, the, the antithesis, is that that word? Of, of what God is telling us. It, it pushes us away from God into uh, really a mind of, of idolatry where we become our own God living to please and to glorify ourselves and we've learned how this many times put Christian ease of, around it, put Christian language around it. But, it. but here Paul is saying, no, no, you got to be willing to go through some things. You got to be willing to carry some weight if we're going to uh, really be what God wants us to be. Who should or who can do such a thing? I mean, it's not easy to put yourself on the back burner and let other folk move ahead. It's not It's not easy to, to take your will, your desire, what, what's going to make you comfortable and, and put it on pause or delay it so someone who may you may not even like or don't like you can have their way and move forward. It's not easy to tell someone else, you go first in life and I'll, I'll, I'll wait. That's not an easy thing to do. So who can do it? In fact, most of the world is not even interested in doing it. They, if, if they find someone who's willing to say, you go first, the, the, the knee-jerk response or reaction to the world is let me take advantage. It, it let me let me take all that you have. You're weak. You don't have the ability to stand. That's their knee-jerk reaction to a true Christian response. But that don't mean we're weak. That don't mean we give them everything that God has given us. It simply says that we keep our focus on the Lord. But who can do such a thing? Who can who can make that work? Paul gives us a list of some things. He says, therefore. If there is any consolation, therefore it says, be ready. In other words, he says, in, in, in the previous chapter, the close of the previous chapter, he says, you got to be willing to suffer. You got to remember that, that what you've heard or watched me do, and now what you're hearing, I'm going through. You got to be willing to go through some stuff. So therefore, it says, be ready to live and suffer for the cause of Christ, as you know is the example. Therefore, if you if there is any consolation, if Jesus, here's the test, y'all. If any one of these things is right, then you are not only qualified, you're called to be willing to suffer for Christ. He says, if Jesus has done anything for you, if, if there be any consolation in Christ, if Jesus has done anything for you. If Jesus has has uh, given you peace of mind and encouragement at any point in your life, has Christ ever done anything for you? Has he ever given you peace of mind? Has he ever encouraged you and, and, and got you through difficult times in a, a hard place? Has he ever has he ever done that? Been, been your consolation, your comforter, your confidant? 
Have you ever went to talk to him when you were going through? He was the only one that you could confide in. He was the only one that you could tell your story to. He was the only one that would hear you and not condemn you and not, and not judge you and not determine that you weren't qualified. He was the only one who would tell you that you're okay, that you can make it, that you're going, you're going to overcome this, that you're going to get out of this, you're going to make it through this. Has he ever consoled you? Has Jesus, if you have any consolation in the Messiah, has that, has that ever happened? If so, the therefore is for you. The therefore is you need to be ready so that you can be willing to serve him and do what he's called for you because called you to do. Why? Because he has given you this peace of mind or encouragement. If Jesus has in any way comforted you, given you rest by an act of divine love, if any comfort of love, has Christ ever showed up and taken the sorrow away? Has he ever taken the sting out of life? Has he ever loved you through a situation where you felt like it was over? Have you ever felt Christ just walk beside you and walk you over and walk you through the pain of it all, the darkness of it all? He has he ever come because he loved you and rescued you out of your own life? Has he ever saved you from you? Has he loved you that way? Paul says, Therefore, if there is any consolation, if any comfort of love, has he ever loved you and put you at peace? Has he ever loved you and gave you rest? Has he ever done that for you? Then he says, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if the Holy Spirit has in any way at any time made the triune God available to you. Has the Holy Spirit at any time and in any way disclosed who Christ is to you? Have you ever had the Spirit remind you of just how big and how great your God is? Have you ever had the Spirit of God jump off the pages of your Bible come through the, the, the lyric of a praise song and remind you of how powerful and how, how awesome your God is. Philippians chapter 2. Have you, have you ever had God, the Spirit of God do that? Paul says here if any fellowship now understand koinia. Koinia don't mean just sitting down, breaking bread together, having a meal. It means the pouring in of one to the other. It's the merger of the two into one. It's, 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 it's a, a, a growth in the development. But when you have fellowship with God, you do all the growing. There, there is no place in God for us to grow. You know, for us to grow him. Okay? We don't grow him. We don't make him better. We don't do his, you know, all of a sudden we, by doing his will, we give God the tactical advantage. We, we, God, God don't need us in that way. God needs us because God desires us. The, the only need that God has for us is to fulfill a desire that he has to fellowship with us, to be with us. He don't need us to be God. He is God with or without my participation. So he, he, he is God. But the text is telling us that if I have fellowship, in my fellowship with the Spirit of God, have I allow the Spirit of God to make me at home in God's presence. To, to, to give me the ability to, to, to hear God and, and to abide in God's place without feeling condemned. Because think about it. Isn't it a miracle that you or I can be in God's presence and not feel condemnation? Th th think about where we come from. Think about what we've done. Think about the track record we leave behind. Think about what we, what's in our backpacks right now. How could that abide in the presence of a holy and righteous God if he didn't give us the grace to lean on him enough not to feel the condemnation that would naturally come? In order to, to do that, we have this fellowship. So Paul is saying, Paul asked the question, have you had this fellowship 
with the Holy Spirit? If so, then the therefore is for us. Those who have been consoled by Christ, those who have been comforted by his love, those who have had any fellowship at all with the Spirit of God, when we come to know God better and stronger, we have obligation to live our lives in a way that bring glory and honor to the, ma to, to the Master, that we live to serve Him. And then he asks if there's any affection or mercy. If you have in any way enjoyed the affection and mercy of God in your life, have you ever not receive what you deserve? Has God ever held back judgment when you know you, you knew you was guilty? Has he ever loved you and, 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 and gave you uh, uh, this, this other, a gift that you didn't deserve? Has, has he ever extended to you affection that you know that you didn't deserve? You had, you had denied him, turned your back on him, did something that might have embarrassed him or, or, or his kingdom, but he still gave you affection. He still loved you. He, he didn't give you what you deserve. He didn't give me what I deserve. Have we ever had that experience with God? That's what Paul is asking here. Have you ever had that? He's reminding us through these series of questions that, or, 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 or pointing out these, these different things of relationship elements of our relationship with God, he's reminding us of just how good and awesome God is and just how appropriate it is for us to live for God's glory and for his honor and how inappropriate it is for us to live selfishly for ourselves. If we, if we become the center of our living, the purpose for our lives, our lives not only are meaningless, it's without purpose. Serving God is the only way that we find true purpose for loving and, and being who he is. Life has no meaning without our serving and surrendering to God. And what gives us permission to do that? How much God loves us. The relationship that we serve or we have with him. So Paul says, look, if any of that's true, if any of that is what it's, meets you. Have you, been con have you been consoled by God? Is there any consolation in Christ? Have you ever been comforted by his love? Have you ever met peace simply because he loved you? Have you ever had any fellowship with the Spirit of God where, where you were welcomed and, and allowed to abide in his presence with, with praise and worship without feeling the condemnation of who you are or what you bring? Do you ever Have you ever had uh, the experience of having God's affection and his mercy active in your life. Has that ever happened for you? He says, if so, then fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Paul encourages the body of believers here to unite together in their collective love for God and others. Paul encourages the body of believers to unite together. He says to them, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. He's given us a goal, a, 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 a touchstone, a way to, to measure, monitor brain activity. What, what are we thinking? You see, there's a whole debate right now in been going on in, in, in science versus metaphysical world is is the mind the brain or is the brain the mind? But Paul says, forget that. There's a mind, there's a spirit that's happening. It's not just what you do with your gray matter. It is it is the spirit that dwells inside of you. The mental capacity that you have to determine what is true and what is not. What is love and what is hate. What is kindness and what is evil? What is good and what is bad? You have that ability inside of you, your mind. So he says here that we ought to do what? Be like-minded, that it's good to live for God no matter what the cost. 
that it's good to give our lives to serve him, to be, to, to get, offer ourselves up as a sacrifice to God. It is good. Paul says that we, the body, ought to be like-minded. That does what? Not only connects the individual to Christ, it connects us. The, the body of Christ is so fragmented because each of us want to carve Jesus up into a personal God and not share him with others. We don't have a personal Jesus. We have a personal relationship with Jesus. So when we come together, we, this, this, this relationship that we have unites us together. It pulls us together. And so he's saying, Paul tells us, be like-minded. That means that I can't fight with you. You, you ought not be condemning me. That we ought to find this place where we come together in Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 2 right now. We ought to come to this place where we, we're, we're, we're searching for the same Christ. Now, like-minded don't mean that we have to agree with every dot and every crossing of the T goes. That's not what like-minded means. Like-minded means we agree on purpose, we agree on mission, we agree on who Jesus is, and we agree on how we serve him. Like-minded, Jesus is Lord. Jesus Christ is the only way to God. That there is a triune God. The resurrection did happen, and it followed the sinless life that followed the virgin birth. That those things are real, and we come like-minded saying, this is who Jesus is, and this is how we serve him, and this is how we glorify him. Like-minded. Now, now, do we do we drink uh, uh, grape juice for communion? Do we have communion every week, or do we have communion on, on, on once a month? Do we have it on Saturdays? Okay, we can talk about those things. But like-minded sense, we agree on who Jesus the Christ is and how he ought to be served in the living of our lives, okay? That's, that's like-minded. And he said he, that we ought to do what? Having the same love. The love that we see him express for Christ Paul, the love that they see him express, but the love that Jesus expressed to us. So it is the same love that we have collectively. So we're bound by mind and spirit. We're bound by what we think and how we understand who Christ is, and we're bound together by this notion of loving him. That's why, that's why it is impossible, the Bible says, to love God and hate your neighbor. Because the, the way that we understand God is a collective love where we love one another as we move together. I cannot stay mad at you and be, and be happy with God. I can't ignore you and just cross you out of my life and, and just say, forget you, I don't care nothing about you, and, 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 and do what? And still be committed to who God is. I'm committed to a flavor of God, but not to all of God. Now understand. What I just said doesn't mean that I have to be committed to you if you're abusing God and me. That's not what that means. It don't mean that I have to subject myself to your demonic wish wishes and your, your, your demon activities. I don't have to I don't have to go I don't have to go there. What it says is that I'm in I'm in the posture that Jesus is in. Jesus has forgiven and he extends a hand of reconciliation. But it's only, a, he's not going to come and make us reconcile. We have to be willing. So when I'm in that posture, you hurt me. You lied on me. You, you did something that, that, that crushed me really bad. My right posture is, I forgive you. I find the strength in God to forgive you. That don't mean I go back into the situation. But I am standing there saying, I'm willing to reconcile. That don't mean that, that reconciliation does not mean that it goes back to what it was. Reconciliation says that we will form a relationship on a different set of ground rules. We will form a relationship on a, with a different set of rules. You know, we're not going to act the same way we used to act. It's going to be different. 
You, that's why when we're reconciled to Christ, those who are truly reconciled to Christ don't act the same way. Because it's different. You can't say I'm saved and your life stays completely the same. Can't. Why? Because reconciliation says that the ground rules have changed and I come to you living differently in order to honor the, the new relationship that we now have. Good? You with me? Okay. So, having the same love. How do you do that? How do you have the same mind? Or what's the response of having the same mind and, and, and the consequence of having the same love? What is it? That we're on one accord and we're on one mind. We agree. We agree and we get along. We agree. And we get along. I, 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 I often have very short conversations. And, and anybody who knows me know I can talk a long time and I can have long conversations. But my conversation is usually very short when I have a church person who all they do is complain about church. I don't go to church because they're a bunch of hypocrites. My conversation is short. You see, because where we really need to start is why you go to church. Okay. Why, where, where we really need to start is what purpose do you have? And, and who are you really serving? Because if, if church people can convince you not to obey God, what do the devilish people convince you of? So, no. No. Either we're going to obey God in front of devilish church people or good sinners. It don't matter. I don't care if sinners are better than some saints. I don't, it don't matter. We're going to obey God. And if God says that we ought to not forsake to assemble ourselves together, if God says we ought to come together and worship, then we find a place where we can do that and not excuse ourselves by saying the church is jacked up. Come on, Pastor. If the church is jacked up, if, if the, okay, if I had my shirt on backwards, okay. my shoes on the wrong feet, okay. y'all wouldn't condemn and talk about the clothes. Okay. You would say something wrong with pastor. Okay. Is that right? Yeah. We're the body of Christ. Oh, we're, the, we're the clothes of Christ that the world sees. Yeah. So why then would we expect that when I condemn the clothes, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the one who's wearing them. All right. If we're the body of Christ and we can condemn Jesus, we're really talking about Christ. Hallelujah. If I condemn the church, I'm really talking about him. So I ain't talking about Jesus. I'm talking about those fake uh -huh. Christians. Oh, back up. Mm. Nowhere in the Bible does it say fake Christian, real Christian, body of Christ. Mm. It says, talks about carnal Christian, talk about people backsliding. But it doesn't say, it doesn't give me the right to go through and cherry pick what I think a good Christian is. We have the responsibility of living on one accord with the body. We that takes struggle. You don't cut your nose off when it starts running. You catch a cold, your nose running, you don't get rid of it. You, you, you stub your toe in the middle of the night. You don't chop off your foot because your toe hurt. Come on. We your, the, the rest of your body tries to help the part that is struggling. That's what the body of Christ ought to be. When, when the body of Christ and Hope Church get a runny nose, the rest of us ought to be a tissue trying to help. We ought to be trying to, instead of con condemning them, we ought to be helping them. That's just the way it, it ought to be. That's the way it, it, it should work. So Paul does something here that is um, interesting to me, challenging to me. And I pray informative to you. Paul ties his personal joy to the willingness of others to honor the presence of Jesus in their lives. He ties his personal joy to the willingness of others to honor the presence of Christ in their lives. Paul says here, Fulfill my joy yes. by being like mine. Yes. 
See, we are all sometimes trying to X people out of our lives so we can have joy. <laughs> Let me get rid of you so I can have joy. I need some peace in my life. Let me get rid of you. We start trying to expel folk from our lives to create this tent of peace. Paul says, I, I depend on you to make my joy full. I need you to be on one accord. I need you to be a, a, be of one mind. I need you to think like this. Make my joy full. He ties his personal joy to others. Man, what a challenge. What a challenge. When we stop trying to get rid of folk and, and keep and, and rather try to get them right or pray them through or pray them to the place where they can they can fulfill God's purpose in their lives because that's how we get joy. That's where it's gonna come from. So Paul says, I, I need I need y'all to be of one accord. I need I need you, church at Philippi, to be the body of Christ. I need you, Hope Church, to be Hope Church so my joy can be full. The only way I can have peace is that y'all grow up and be who God wants you to be. Paul is saying to us here, grow up, love each other, serve God, and then he'll have a reason to have joy. You, 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 it's easy to understand, parents. When your child is acting crazy, you feel sad and disturbed and, oh God, what did I do and how do I fix it? But when they finally get it right or seem like they're hitting on all cylinders, you get happy, you call folk, you tell them they're doing good. I mean, why? Why? It's not you. When they're hungry, you ain't hungry. When they they finally start paying their rent, you ain't paying it. Well, that's a good thing. But then, why, so why do you get so happy about that? Because the, your joy is literally tied yes. to them. Yes. That's how we as the body ought to see the body. Yes. That our joy is literally tied to the welfare of the body. Mm-hmm. It's not, we can't just say that's, that's the church, mm-hmm. this is my job, this is my house. That's how the world lives. That's the church. You know, I can act like I want to on my job because that ain't the church. I'm holy at church, but, you know, this is just business. We, can't, we don't have that luxury if we're really going to serve God because who we serve and how we serve him. So our joy is tied to him, to, to, to the body of Christ. Let's look at verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now, this is a text that folk oftentimes just try to cut out the Bible. Come on. Because they're saying it, that's just not practical in the world we live in. That's just not how the world operates. If you, if you live that way, People are going to take advantage of you. Um, if you live that way, they're going to say you have, you're depressed or you have low self-esteem. There's stuff that's going on with you. It, it's, it's just not. And then we want to get that out of the way because we want to feel like we're keeping God's word, but we don't want to feel like we're being weak. And, and, and this, this here says that I can't be number one in my own life. Right. So it says, well, uh, Maybe maybe this text is, uh, we look for a a more um, uh, user-friendly interpretation. (laughs) You know, we we, we need another way to look at this, right? But I think Paul says what he meant. And he says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Selfish ambition is don't be moved or motivated by desires to exalt or put forward or advance yourself. Right. Don't be moved or motivated by a desire to exalt, put forward, or advance yourself. Now I can hear it. I can hear it. But what about on my job? You know, I do a good job trying to get advancement on my job, trying to get 
That's what you figure out. <laughs> I'm trying to do a good job. You know, I'm trying to be, be, be motivated and, and, and move forward on my job. But you mean I can't, I can't, I can't work? I can't do that? I can't, I can't show? No, that's not what this text is saying. The Bible, the, 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 the whole conversation of the Bible tells us that we ought to do a good job, that we ought to render good work, that we ought to work as unto God and not as I please us. So it tells us that. But what this is saying is don't do it for selfish ambition. In other words, when you do a good job, don't, don't, don't do it because you want the boss to see and, and pat you back, give you a promotion or give you a bonus. Do it to honor God. See, everything we do in our lives should be God-focused. It yeah. don't say I can't do a good job. It don't say I can't accept the promotion. It says I need to, if I get the promotion, I need to be figuring out how to use that promotion to further honor God. But So all that we do is should be focused to honor God. God should be the motivation. He should be that which moves us to act. To believe, to think, to talk. And so many times we leave God out of our day-to-day -day lives that we, we, we only include him when we're in trouble or in what spiritual matters that we forget that every matter is a spiritual matter. Yes. Everything you do, everything I do, everything I say is a spiritual matter. And all spiritual matters belong to God and all matters are spiritual. Mm -hmm. So we got to trust God. This whole separation of secular and sacred is man-made, it's demonic in nature. Wow. What it tries to do is, is carve out a place where God is not welcome. Come on, sir. We cannot have a peace in our lives where we tell God, this is off limits to you. This is secular. No. We serve God with our whole lives, and our whole lives ought to be motivated to glorify Him. We're not working for a promotion. We ain't working for a bigger payday. We ain't work. Those who work for bigger houses never find a home. <laughs> they may get a bigger house, but they won't get a home. We don't have, we can't, we can't, we can't see it that way. We have to have the place where what we're doing is motivated, is built to exalt God. Okay? That's why we do it. If you go to school, go to school so you can get better equipped to, motivate, to, to magnify God. If you, if you work hard on your job, you get a promotion, use that promotion. Find a way to use it to do what? To promote and magnify God. It may mean you have more to give. It may mean that you can now find another person that you can bless and help. It may mean that you can help a student go to school, can't go to school. It just may mean that now you're in a position where you can get rid of some demonic practices on your job. It, whatever it is, Find a way to use what God has given you to what? Glorify Him. Let God be the motivation and that motivates you and move you to action and not selfish ambitions. Don't do it for you. And he also said don't do it for conceit. And I, for a minute I thought that it, he was driving the point home by being redundant. But not, not really. You see, because deceit is slightly different. Motivation is I'm doing it for selfish ambition, but I may do that in the background. I may pull strings in the back. I may I may I may do some stuff, manipulate the, the environment so I can go forward. Nobody really know I did it, but but I'm doing it. I know I'm doing it for me, and it's really selfish in, in, in nature. Conceit says you shine the light on yourself. You see pride and recognition. You feed your desire and lust for attention. I do it because of conceit. I do it because I want to, I think I'm all that. I want to show people I'm all that. And I want people to recognize I'm all that. And I shine the light on, on me. Even if I only shine the light on the part that I think is all that. Are you with me? I only shine the light on, on the part that I think got it going on. So I ain't really, I ain't really conceited. I'm, I'm just showing people, you know, but my, my strengths. If you're bringing, 
You know why you're doing it. If you're showing people your strength so they can glorify God and be encouraged to develop their own strength and move forward, that's cool. If you're showing people your strength because you want them to see how good you are, how, how, how good of a prayer you is, and how good of a pastor you are. If you want people to see how good you are, well, I'm a good Christian, and, and I'm a good talker, and I, I'm a good this, and I'm a good that. If you want people to see that and tell you how good you are and be impressed with you, then that's probably that word conceit. <laughs> but if we're doing it for his glory and for his honor, if we're, we're, we're trying to encourage people, okay, if we're trying to encourage, that it's not invalid, it's right here in the Bible. But anyway, <laughs> but if, we, if, if, we, if we're trying, if we're trying to, do, to do that, to glorify God, then we're, then we're good, all right? Then he says, but in loneliness of mind that each esteem others better, is that word better yeah. than himself? Yeah. Now, if you just yeah. tell me, you know, be humble of mind and esteem others along with myself, yeah. Yeah. I'm cool. You know, or just tell me, you know, pay attention to some other people sometimes. I'm cool with that. But but it's that that word, that word better, that, that kind of messed me up. But, yes. but it's, I think Paul was telling us that in humility and modesty, we all seek to shine the light of attention on others. In, humil in, in sincere humility and modesty, we ought to shine the light on others. And the other that you shine the light on should not be a mere reflection of you. We should be. Like your kids and family. Yeah. Or when you shine a light on them, you take credit for them. Okay. They're doing so good now, but I pray so hard, child. <laughs> They're doing so good, but oh, I I talk with them and had to teach them every night. Well, they're doing so good now, but but you know, I had to get up every day and take them to school so they could learn and study. See, it, it's like you shine the light on them, but you turn it around. Come on. No, 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 no. See, it says in, in humility, we, we we ought to esteem others better than us. We, we, we are, they're, they're worth they're they're worth the effort. Yes. They're worth my time. Yes. They're worth what I have to go through. They're worth the effort. They're, they're, they're worth it. And, and, and as we esteem them as being worth it. Don't mean I can fix them. Don't mean it's even my job to try to fix them. But they're worth what God would have me to do as a participant in their lives. Whatever that is, they're worth it. I don't do it except oh, God's making me do it. Child, you know that child ain't here. gonna never be nothing. Well, no, no, no. He's worth it. Yes. She's worth it. And, and we, we do it because they're worth it. And sometimes we lose sight of their worth, sight of their value, and that's why God got to put us in check. Because when we lose sight of their worth, we lose sight of God. When I lose sight of another's worth and value, I lose sight of God. Because I now think that somehow, some way, I'm preferred by God over others. Come on, Pastor. And I'm not. God don't love me more than he loved anyone else. He doesn't, he doesn't care for me more than he cares for anyone else. He don't desire me to be in his presence more than he desires the worst sinner to be in his presence. Mm -hmm. The problem is that, the, or the blessing, depending on how you look at it, is God's righteousness won't let the worst sinner abide forever in his presence. Mm -hmm. And it's only that the grace of God washes enough sin off of us yeah. that we are qualified now by the blood of Jesus to abide in his presence. It is not does not equate to God's desire for one over the other. So when I start thinking that somehow I'm better, somehow I, 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 I have a, a greater right to God than you have, when I start thinking that way, then I lose sight of God because that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible loves us all, calls us all, beckons us all, forgave us all. Jesus died for us all, and he... And he he is not picking you over me or me over you. He's just saying, come. And it's the one who's willing to be reconciled, change your life, and reach out to God that they have the ability to be with him eternally. Okay? So, so we, we have this thing where in humility and modesty, we seek to shine the light of attention on other folk. 
put the flashlight on them, the spotlight go on them. We applaud them. We celebrate who they are and what they've done. We coach them. They're worth our time and our effort. And that's not a bad thing. That's a really, really, really good thing. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. This flies right in the face of, I know the way I was, the world I grew up in, it flies right in the face of it. And I suspect for most of us, it flies in the face of what in the world that you grew up into. That we should focus on what benefit others more than we focus on what benefit us. That flies right in the face of how I was brought up. It says, let each of, uh, let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but for the interests of others. And I got to make what matters to you matter to me. Man, my life is influenced not simply by what's important to me. My life gets influenced by what's important to you. But understand the goal, the mission, the purpose, the, the caveat over all of this is Christ. I do it for the cause of Christ. So if your interest is going to the bar getting drunk every Thursday, I ain't got to go with that. I ain't got to deal with that. Why? Because that goes into the face of the one who I'm really following. So what's important to you is important to me, but I only can participate to help you achieve it if it glorifies God. If, it, if it's not according to his will, don't glorify him. It's important to me, but what, the way I'm going to deal with it, I'm going to pray. I'm going to coach you away from it. I'm going to give you other alternatives. I'm going to ask God to do something different in your life. It's important that you want to go out and get drunk every Thursday. That's important to me. But I ain't going to the bar with you. What I will do is I'll pray. And I'll ask, I'll ask God to change your heart and your mind. I'll tell you that that's probably not the best place to be. But and it's important. But my participation in your, what's important to you is governed by my relationship with God. It's, a, it's not that it's insignificant. It's not that it's not important. It is important. It is significant because it's important to you. But how I participate in it is governed by my relationship with God. Yes. I'm going to participate, and you may not like how I participate, <laughs> But my participation will be my best attempt to glorify God in this matter. Yes. You with me? Yes. Okay. All right. So that's, that's, that's how we, we see this thing. So we should not just focus on what benefits us while minimizing the benefits of others. We should see that stuff as important too. Because only when we truly trust in God to care for us are we liberate to care for others? I can't think your stuff is important. I can't give you the time that's necessary to, 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 to work with you on stuff that matters to you. And, and I, you know what? I, 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 I can't even really think that you're worth all that time if, if I haven't been liberated enough to trust God with my stuff. If I can't trust God to take care of me, then I'm going to be too busy taking care of me to deal with you. So people say, look, I ain't got time to get in nobody else's business. I got too much. I, I, I use all my time trying to take care of my own. Well, that sounds good. And I understand the meaning behind it. But I don't really think that's the biblical model. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't get involved in your life because I'm so busy taking care of my own. My involvement in your life really should be measured and monitored by my relationship with God. And my relationship with God tell me how I ought to be participating in your life. So it's not that I'm so busy taking care of my own that I can't deal with you. But my dealing with you is a way of me taking care of my own. Yes and no. You with me? All right. Okay. Let's, 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 let's go to the next verse then. Let's go to verse 5. We, we, we've been through four verses, y'all. We've covered a lot already. <laughs> <laughs> We did four of them. All right. <laughs> Let's go to verse five. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, 
who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself with no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of, of, of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah, hallelujah. What a God, what a God, what a God. Okay. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Now, we are to be, who, who here want to be like Christ? You know, we want to be like Jesus, right? We want to model him, be the image of him, be, be his image bearer, be, be his body. Now, but what Paul just told us up top is kind of hard, you know. Uh, he told us some difficult stuff. But what, what, what Paul has tactically and, and skillfully done is told us we, we, we ought to be willing to suffer. He told us what Christ has done for us and, and how he's worked through it. Giving us understanding of, of how we ought to consider others and, and how we ought to, you know, uh, surrender ourselves. And then he says, this mind that I just said that you ought to have, that's the same mind that's in Christ Jesus. What I just told you above is, is the image, the model that Christ presents to us, gives to us, and therefore if you want to be like him, then you, you need to, to pay attention to what I just told you and start doing that because that's what he did. That's who he was and who he is in our lives. But what do you mean, Paul? Well, let's, let's walk through what Paul just tells us about Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. The mind of Christ is the one that Paul just told us about, the one of humility, the one of selflessness, selflessness, not selfishness, but selflessness. That, that's what the mind of Christ is talking about. So Christ, Paul tells us right here, is in every way God. In every way he is God. He did not think it robbery to be, he didn't think it a scandal. He didn't think it uh, unreasonable un, uh, to, to claim divinity. He is in every way God. But he did not live to build a great reputation for himself while on earth. Ain't that what it says? Yes. He did not, what, build his own reputation. Right. He's God, and he doesn't do God things to build a reputation for himself. Yeah. It's not that he don't do God things, but he doesn't do God things to build a reputation for himself. He, in fact, he tells folks, look, don't tell folk who I am. You, you go, go on, but don't you tell nobody. You t I just healed you, but, but keep it to yourself. Go to your family. Look, he, he didn't build this great, he wasn't about trying to build this great reputation for himself while on earth. So what does that say? He wasn't driven by selfish ambition. Ain't that what Paul just tell us? Don't be driven by selfish ambition. We can see that Jesus was not driven by selfish ambition because one who was, was self-ambitious would have what? He would have showed everybody. He would call the big meetings and look, I'm going to hear these people. Y'all need to come see. He would look, bring your best offering because I'm going to lay hands on somebody. He would have, he would have been holding up tent meetings and, 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 and just calling fire down from heaven. Oh, look, what? Well, look, y'all. He, he would have been doing all kinds of stuff that he was capable of doing, right. but he did not do because he wasn't here for only for himself. It wasn't, he wasn't self-ambitious. So Paul tells us what to be like Jesus was. Don't be all about, don't go around trying to build this great reputation for yourself. It is, it is for God and for his glory and his honor. Jesus didn't come presented himself as the king of heaven. 
He didn't come present himself as the almighty, the all-knowing, the everywhere present at the same time kind of God. He didn't come and say, he said, yes, he identified with God the Father. The Father and I, we are one. But he did, he did not come, and his service was not, I am the great I am. I am the almighty God. He didn't come presenting himself that way, talking about himself that way. He came as the lowly servant. He came as the, as, as, as the sheep, the slain from the beginning of the, of, of, of the world. He came as, as the one ro who rode into town, not on a white charger, but a donkey. He, he did not come presenting himself as the king of heaven, the almighty, the all-knowing, all of that. He, that's not his, that was not his rhetoric about himself. Now, I'm talking about what he said about him. I ain't saying what other people say about him. He did not come proclaiming or seeking that, revealing that, presenting that to others. He didn't do that. He came to us as one of us. That's what, ain't that what Paul just said? He took on himself the form of a man. He came to us as one of us, as a servant. He focused on the light of heaven on humanity and not himself. So what is that? Conceit. He, he didn't come bringing the attention to all of his good points. Ah. He came and he focused the light, the power, the strength, the glory of heaven. He focused that on humanity. He prayed that we might be one with the Father as he is one. That, that, we, we, that the glory of God would show through us. He came not conceited, not showing, driving himself with, with trying to be uh, all the attention on him. He came as one of us. So church, that might be a hint as to how we should engage the world. We engage the world not as somebody in the ivory tower and too good to say hello to a sinner. So holy that if they slip up and say a word that we just stopped saying last week, we act like we all offended. We can't, we can't, we can't, we can't be so, so, so. Sensitive. Oh, right. We can't be, we can't be so spiritually fragile that the world can't breathe on us heavy without us being offended and turning away. We have to be willing to, to do what? To not present ourselves as something that's better, but present ourselves as one who's taken the right option. I'm not better, I just made a better choice. I'm no different. I just, I just, I'm just traveling a different road. And that better choice, that different road, won't let me do what you do. It won't let me go where you go. But it will let me come on your road long enough to tell you that you need to get on the road with me. Yes. Yes. You see, so that that's that's where Jesus Jesus came as one of us, but he didn't sin like us. Okay. He came like one of us, but he did not offend the Father like one of us. He came like one of us, but he didn't start the journey the way we did. And so when we come go to the world, we say, I'm here, but I ain't really, you know, I, 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 ain't, I'm the, I didn't get here from the same place as you. Yeah. You got here from a sin and desire, a selfless desire. I'm here in this moment from a selfless desire trying to tell you about one who died for you. Yeah. You see the difference? I hope you do. I pray you do. The, Jesus humbled himself and, and accepted the death of a cross taking our curse upon himself. Is that right? He suffered death, even the death of the cross. Is that what your Bible said? So he, Jesus, he, he humbled himself and accepted, he accepted death. Death didn't overpower him. Death didn't impose itself on him. He accepted it. He accepted it because, you see, you, the world really can't make you witness. The world really can't make you go out there and, 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 and engage with it. You have to accept the challenge to be the voice of God in the world. Yes. You, have to, you have to accept that. So he, 
accepted this death on the cross. And what's that mean? That his focus and his concern was on the benefit of others. Yes. He did what he did. He accepted the death so because it benefited us. Yes. That's different than how we live, ain't it? <laughs> don't we do most of the stuff we do or don't do the stuff that we don't do because it's a benefit to us? Come on. How much of our lives do we really live to benefit somebody else? Ooh. How many choices do we really make with the, with the full understanding that it's for somebody else's good? How, how, how do we do that? You see, but here we see that Christ, he makes this decision simply because he's focused on our concerns. And that's what Paul told us to do. Paul told us that we ought to esteem others what? Better than ourselves, worth of, worthy of our time, worthy of the effort, that their, their stuff matters, and we ought to see that, and we ought to focus or pay attention to their interests and not just our own. Glory. That, that, and that we see that's exactly what Jesus did here. Why did you do that, Jesus? Because Jesus was following his mind. <laughs> Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Right. Jesus was following this mind, this divine mind. And that's why Paul says, put that mind in you yes. so you can do this stuff. You're not going to do it if you don't turn your spirit in that direction. Glory. If I don't turn my spirit in that direction, I'm going to live like the world and call myself holy. Mm -hmm. I have to turn my myself. In that, in that way so I can live for God and I can because Jesus what God exalted him because he did and he lived the way he did on earth the Paul says that God exalted him and gave him authority over all why is this world rocking our knots why is this world so hard to us why does the church seem to be losing ground? Because we have lost our minds. Mm. We lost the focus on Christ. I didn't say we're crazy. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we lost the focus. That we're no longer focused on Christ and doing, living our lives the way he lived. Living our life for his glory and his honor. And when we don't live that way, God can't exalt us. Jesus. The exaltation comes as we follow Christ. Then he exalts us. Why? Why was who, who, who Enoch, right? Why was Enoch taken? What was the testimony? He pleased God. He believed God. He pleased him. He trusted. He was taken. Why? Because he believed God. He was taken because he believed. He pleased God. Exaltation comes as we please God. How we please God? Paul just told us, let this mind be in you. Stop living for selfish gain. Stop being conceited. Think other people are worth it. See the worth and the value in, in other people. Give yourself for the good of others and don't just live selfishly for your own benefit and for your own good. That's 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 hitting the down button. When I live, when I live selfishly, I'm getting on the down escalator. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not being exalted. I'm, I'm pulling myself, pulling myself down. So God's, God's satisfaction and pleasure with all of creation will. Okay, when when God is satisfied and God is pleased, to God's satisfaction and to God's pleasure, according to God's will, all of creation will bow and worship and proclaim in a voice of praise that Jesus is Messiah and Lord of all. Look what the mind got him. God exalted his name, his authority overall, gave him authority over everything. Now authority just gives you a right to control. It does not earn you the right to be worshiped. Okay? Authority, the police out there have authority. That gives them the right to stop you. Give them the right to arrest you. It does not demand that you worship them. Okay? So God gives him authority, a name of authority. Every, this whole earth will have to recognize his authority. 
And because of who he is, this whole wor world will come, so much too late, will come to a place where they will worship him. They will bow down and worship, and they will proclaim with a voice that Jesus is Messiah and Lord of all. Do that now, and let's help others do that now by having this mind of Christ active, alive, and living in us. Okay? I, I, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. But I'm going to give homework. Because all I, all I was going to do is I was going to read verses 12 through 16. And then I was going to ask one question and open the floor. So I'm, I'm going to ask one question. Write the question down. Remember the question. And then spend some time thinking about it, praying about it. The question is this. Considering what we talked about tonight, considering the mind of Christ and the words of Paul calling us to take on the mind of Christ, how do we understand and how are we impacted by verses 12 through 16? When we consider the mind of Christ and the words of Paul and how he encourages us to take on the mind of Christ and how we ought to consider others, and what we talked about tonight. What do we take away from verses 12 through 16? What's the takeaway? And I was just going to read it and we're going to open it up. But it's a little late for that. So spend some time. You know, your, a little bit of your devotional time. If you don't have devotion, create a special devotion. Just get with God and say, God, help me to, to hear your voice and see what you're saying to me. And then just consider it and see how it impacts your life. All right? Questions, concerns, thoughts? All right, come on, let's pray. Yeah. <laughs>